to have you, would you just continue to sing with us?
I was buried. I needed rescue, my son was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I need a shelter, I was an orphan. But you called me a citizen of heaven. scripted it looks like we still got some people coming in so if if you have room and want to scoot in a little bit that'd be super cool but anyway we're going to transition into a time of our service we call communion uh, you may have heard this talked about as the Lord's Supper uh, it's a time where we take a couple of symbols and you may have noticed when you came in there's little cups that have juice and a wafer on top and this is intended for Christ followers if you're not a Christ follower do not feel pressured do not feel awkward this is not meant to single you out but what we as Christians do is we take part in the Lord's Supper, which is taking the wafer as the bread of life, Jesus' body. And we take the juice to represent the wine or the blood of Christ. So the night before he was crucified, Jesus has his disciples. And he's taken them through this way of a, what we call a, a sacrament or an, an ordinance. There's two of them given. Baptism's one. This is the other. So we're to do this as often as we desire in a way to remember Christ and that sacrifice he made for us. So in 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul is giving the account of what Jesus took these men through. And Jesus is telling him, he says, For I received from the Lord what I have passed on to you. Then the Lord Jesus on the night he's betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. At SMCC, we try to do this at least once a month as a way to just remind ourselves what that sacrifice was. So if, if, you, want, if, if you didn't get one coming in the door and you want to, feel free to step back and grab one now. Um, but we can do this together as a group. And it's a way to remember that Jesus sacrificed himself willingly for us. Because without his sacrifice, we have no way to heaven. And he made that so easy for us. So just as we start in this next song, you guys remain seated. Take your time, pray on it, think on it, just meditate in that moment to, to reflect on what that promise is for us. That Jesus' death on the cross, through that, we have the opportunity to live in heaven with him forever. So just take this moment to focus on that. Uh, and whenever you're ready, if you feel like you want to, throughout this next song, you guys are welcome to stand and sing with us.
above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Today we lift our hearts to your beautiful name. You are worthy of all praise. As we sing, let's reflect on the power and significance of Jesus' name. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. The silence and bones of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The praise. We can have eternal life through you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. We are so happy to have you here with us at SMCC Lehigh. We are one church with five locations and two different languages. You know what? I just want to hear everybody say that you're having a good morning. Are you having a good morning? Yeah, yeah there we go. There we go. All righty. So when you came in, you probably had some wonderful people greeting you, but that's not the only way that we want to connect with you. So if you could, there's a connection card in your seat back that we would love for you to fill out, or you can do our digital one and you can take it to the person at the green table in the lobby. We just want to hear how your experience here was. And by the way, my name is May. I didn't introduce myself. How rude. <laughs> and I'm the worship pastor here or leader here. And I love it. Um, and then we've got this Friday, we are so excited. We have our Fall Fest coming up. I know, let's get excited about it. We are excited. We have got over 200, like almost 250 people already registered. So we are stoked for that. But we need you to keep registering if you're planning on coming that way that we can be prepared for you, for your friends that you're bringing. And you can do that at the QR code. There are still opportunities for you to serve if you want to do that. And one way that you can also serve is we have our clean team. And these people are amazing. They're people that come in week in and week out and make sure that our facilities are nice and clean for our guests on Sunday. So we appreciate them. If that's a way that you would like to serve, we would love to have you. 
Another important thing is we have got our women's worship night coming up on November 2nd. This will be at our Draper campus at 7 p.m. It's just going to be a night where women, we can get together and we can just lift up the name of Jesus. And then it's going to fire this one, but that one's not right. Go to the next one. <laughs> tricky, tricky. Where's Pastor Ben? Here he is. Today is <laughs> Pastor Appreciation Day. He didn't know that I was doing this, so it won't be a surprise next service. <laughs> tricky, tricky. So we just want to say thank you because, Ben, we love you, and you have come in, and you have just loved on us, and you have led us so well, and we appreciate you more than we could ever say. So if you see him today, catch him, give him a pat on the back, tell him he's doing a good job, give him a handshake, just tell him that we love him and we really do appreciate him. And guys, that's all I got for you today. Again, we're so happy that you're here, but I want you to just turn to your neighbors, say hello, shake some hands, get to know some names, and then we'll get into the rest of our service. Well, good morning, good morning. My name's Ben, and I do have the privilege of uh, pastoring here at our Lehigh campus. And um, thank you. That, that was a surprise. I appreciate, appreciate that, May. That was very kind. If I haven't met you, though, I would love to meet you in the lobby afterwards. Um, and just uh, if you have any questions for me, um, uh, please, please don't hesitate to ask anything. Uh, well, guys... This morning, we are continuing a series that we started last week, and we're calling it With Confidence. And there's a reason for that. It's because of the, what's being dealt with in this letter, this book of the Bible, that this guy named Paul, many of you guys, that may sound familiar, he writes most of the New Testament. He starts a bunch of churches, and he writes letters to encourage and to guide them and he's writing to this church in Thessalonica because they are going through it. Have you ever gone through it? <laughs> They're going through it in an, a really tough way. They're going through incredible persecution. And Paul himself knows something about that. We're going to get into some details of, of his firsthand experience of that. So he's a great person to really encourage this church that he started we get some inside information. We looked at this last week in the book of Acts that he comes in and in three weeks, this blows me away, okay? I've been a part of a lot of church planning things, starting new churches and stuff. And, and for Paul in three weeks to start this church in Thessalonica, and then he's kind of pushed out some of the persecution that he suffers. And, uh, but he hears amazing reports of how it has flourished which says a ton about the power of the message that he brought them, the gospel, the good news, and the evidence that backed it up in order for them to solidly take on persecution and continue to be a thriving church. And so that's why we're calling it with confidence, because I don't know about you, when you go through tough things and you're challenged by a lot of things, man, your confidence can really crumble. And Paul knew this, so he wanted to encourage them. Last week, we saw that the best way that Paul said, this is how I can bring the best encouragement to you, 
is to encourage them to focus on Jesus, to, put, to fix their eyes on him. And that would be the most wonderful encouragement they can have. Why? Because Jesus brings them hope, real life, the true God, meaning and purpose and direction in life. And so that's the kind of encouragement that he brings them, and I hope you were encouraged last week by that as well. Well, here's what we're going to see in the second uh, chapter of First Thessalonians. We're going to see a blueprint for spiritual growth as we look at, as Paul kind of describes his work and, and his life a little bit, and then he also gives some description to this church and, and what they're doing and that's what it gives us. Have you ever felt stuck in your spiritual journey? Have you ever felt stuck like, I don't know what to do next? As a pastor, I've heard a lot of people share that with me. I've experienced it myself. You know, someone, they, they come to faith in Jesus. They start following Jesus. They get connected to a church, you know. Maybe they, they take that step of being baptized. And then they come meet me in the lobby and talk to me because I encourage them to do that every morning. And they say, hey, Pastor Ben, what do I do next? What's my next step? What should I do now? And so I hope this is really practical and helpful this morning as we are going to look at the pattern, the blueprint. Because when you don't know what to do, what do you need? You need a, a road map. You need to figure out kind of what's next. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning, this blueprint in the second chapter of spiritual growth. Blueprint for spiritual growth is this. Jesus invites us to be equipped in our head, in our hearts, and our hands. Now, if you have come here a few times or you've been here several times and you walk in our doors, sometimes this stuff becomes a little white noise and we don't notice it. But as you walk in our lobby, on the right-hand side, there's three posters that say this. There's some other posters and things that we have on the wall, but it says head, heart, and hands. And some of you guys might have kind of said, what does that mean? That sounds like wonderful platitudes, but, but what are they trying to communicate? So I hope after this morning you'll know exactly what we're trying to tie those things to and how the biblical writings really um, reveal this and show us this. So a blueprint for spiritual growth, let me give some definitions to head, heart, and hands. Head, heart, and hands are this. The head, what we're referring to, is biblical and theological maturity. Because we're trying to grow. We're trying to take our next step in our Christian walk. And this isn't just knowledge. If it stops at knowledge, uh, we've missed the boat. It's understanding. It's being able to differentiate between false things and true things. Specifically, uh, it, it, it comes uh, it, it becomes very important when we look at the gospel, the good news, the message of the Christian faith, and the very nature and characteristics of Jesus. Those are particularly two areas where we want to be mature in our understanding of those things. And then heart. What is heart? It is our emotional and relational maturity. We're going to see this play out in some beautiful examples of this in this second chapter. And then hands is, okay, what do we do? How do we use the gifts and talents and passions that God's given us to actually build up the body of Christ? Um, and, and to illustrate this, I'm going to ask you guys a question. This isn't rhetorical. I want some feedback. What is your favorite sitcom? <laughs> Friends? The Office? The Office? What was that? Seinfeld. Anybody else? Those of, that's, all of those, I think, hit the top ten of, like, everybody's, like, most famous sitcom. I heard one back there. Parks and Rec. Man, such good stuff. Um, a lot of entertainment for us uh, these days when we're watching sitcoms. And my wife is a bit obsessed with Friends. Uh, she went to the Friends Experience downtown, uh, which is, what is that? A way to make money off of people who are obsessed with Friends. So she went down there with a friend of hers and did the whole thing, got some swag, 
paid to get her picture taken with, you know, like the couch going up the stairs, pivoting and stuff like that. And all I got to experience was a hit to my bank account. But even now, we are again, I'm surprised, watching and going through friends. We're, we're right at the point where uh, they come back from London and Monica and Chandler are, are trying to hide their relationship. Okay, some of you guys know what I'm talking about. Sad. Okay. Why do I mention this? If you know these characters, and, and just try to follow along with me if, you know, you're like, okay, I think I've seen an episode or two. You've got these six friends. And what's interesting about them is you see some lack of maturity in their lives. And I think it absolutely can, can mesh up with what we're talking about here this morning. So you have Joey and Phoebe. Now, among the friend group, they are very relational. So they're very strong in that aspect in their heart. They're willing to do anything for their friends. They kind of go above and beyond. They're very kind and compassionate in that way. But perhaps in the intellectual maturity of the head, they may be lacking a little bit. And it affects them as we watch their stories unfold. It affects their life and their careers and, 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 and things that they're doing. The, uh, the second couple that I think is similar is uh, Chandler and Monica, and they wind up being a couple. Part of it uh, is because they have relational issues. They both kind of have relationship issues, and so they kind of have some, some uh, common ground in that and become a couple. Sorry to give it away, but it's 20 years old. You know, I don't feel bad. Um, but, but what they also seem to have um, a lot of concern and heart for their friends, right? They, they're willing to to kind of go above and beyond and, and to do what's necessary for them. But that relational issue um, kind of holds them back in many ways. Uh, they also, at an intellectual level, they're both pretty successful in their careers, and, and that's an area where they actually thrive in. But it's that relationship issue. But then we have Rachel and Ross. And it's kind of interesting. They both thrive in their in their careers, right? And, and they do well if you know their story and background. And, and uh, while, they're, while they're friends, I mean, I guess that's why they call this show that, um, they seem to not be the people who go out of their way to discover and help the needs of others, right? And, and we see this. We see these weaknesses. We see these kind of character flaws in these uh, characters. So something's missing, right? We can kind of see this, in, and I know that's just an illustration, and illustrations all fall apart, but I hope that kind of gets us on the track of thinking, like, okay, is there something that God wants to, to kind of fully develop in us, and are we missing an aspect that he is guiding us in? Do you feel stuck in your spiritual maturity and your spiritual walk. So when you're stuck, uh, when we're stuck in life, we need a blue blueprint that clarifies the way forward. All right? So even though, and I love this, when we look at biblical writings, we recognize that when we look at the New Testament, they're 2,000 years old. And they're written in a different language, to a different culture, in a different setting, they're dealing with different issues. We, we address some of them, and yet humans are the same. And what's true for them back then is true for us today. And so this can absolutely apply to us and be incredibly helpful as we jump into 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's look at the spiritual growth pattern that's displayed to us. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of our God, we dared to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. For the, uh, for the appeal we made does not spring from error or impure motive, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know, we never use flattery 
nor did we put on a mask to cover up greed. God is our witness. We were not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted our authority. So he kind of talks about some, some background that this church would know about what happened. That they were, what was the term he used? Outrageously. That they were treated outrageously in Philippi. Here's what happened to Paul. And he's using the, the plural like we, us, because he's got a couple guys with him, Silas and Timothy. And when they were in Philippi, before they came to Thessalonica, they were pushed out of, of that city. And not only were they pushed out, first they were thrown into jail and they were beaten. And then they were humiliated. They were basically put in the stocks in the public square. But then the city officials went, uh-oh, Paul is a Roman citizen, which not everybody just a part of, of the Roman Empire was. But that meant something. And that gave you extra protection and extra rights. And so when the, the officials found that out, they went, uh-oh, let's just let him go. Because they thought we could get in trouble for how we've treated Paul. And so they let him go, but they, he leaves in those kind of circumstances, being, you know, just treated terribly. And, and, and I mean, physically, even what, what he's gone through must have been uh, atrocious. And what does that point to, though, when we see him and his, his uh, two companions um, continuing to do the same thing. That shows a lot of character, a lot of spiritual maturity, right? They had the, um, the spiritual maturity within their heads to, to actually continue on in their journey to do something incredibly difficult, right? That you didn't see the kind of um, frailty that, that well, I think about in that circumstance, how would I have reacted? Um, especially in certain points and times in my life, I might have been, I, I'm done, I'm out. I got beaten to an inch of my life. I got thrown into prison. I'm pushed out. All because I came into a community trying to share good news. But, but you see incredible spiritual maturity in him and in his, uh, his crew there. He's also addressing a couple things that are pretty obvious. He is getting criticized, and he knows the criticism that people in Thessalonica are telling this new group of believers because they must be telling them things that Paul is defending himself uh, based on. He's like, I'm not here for greed. I mean, think about what he's going through. It kind of reminds me of, of actually a personal experience of mine uh, when I came here to Utah 11 years ago. I had a neighbor, a friend of mine. We did become friends, but at first he was pretty opposed to who I was and what I was doing. I came here to, to be a part of planting and starting churches. And uh, his, his, main, um, his main criticism was, I know what you're about. You're a pastor. You're paid. You're here for financial gain. And I literally, I was very kind and nice to this guy. Like I said, we became friends. But at that point, I laughed out loud. Because this is not a place you should come to to start churches in Utah. This isn't a place for financial gain. <laughs> I was like, I, I came from Texas. I, 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 was, I was a part of serving and working in churches in Texas. If I was here for financial gain, it just makes no sense whatsoever. And Paul's saying it in a more dramatic way. He's saying, oh, you think I'm in this for financial gain? I was almost beaten to death. And then I came to Thessalonica, and a similar thing happened in three weeks. Why was he only there three weeks? Because he was pushed out. An angry mob pushed him out. And he went through so many things in his journey of spreading the gospel and starting churches within the Roman Empire. We jump back into the book of Acts, and we see just incredible things that he suffered through, being shipwrecked. Wrecked. He was even bitten by po poisonous snakes. And then, of course, like I've mentioned many times, he was beaten. He was imprisoned. He was falsely accused. So many things. And what was he before that? He was a plush, respected religious leader, a Pharisee among Pharisees. And why did he give it all up? Because he encountered truth and he encountered Jesus. And so he's defending himself and saying, look, don't, 
don't, don't think I have wrong motives or, or, or something like that. But yet we see that beautiful spiritual maturity in his life. Going on in, uh, in the uh, second chapter, let's jump into verse 7. It says, instead, we were like young children among you. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Surely you remember, brothers and sisters, our toil and hardship. We work day and night in order not to be a burden to anyone while we preach the gospel of God to you. You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into kingdom and his kingdom and glory. Wow, what a transition from understanding uh, where Paul's coming from, sharing, having this beautiful knowledge and, uh, of the gospel and it's driving him to even go through persecution to do you hear how loving and kind and relational Paul and his group is? I mean, look at those descriptions that I just read. We cared for you. We loved you like family. Towards the bo bottom of that passage, we came to be an encouragement and to bring comfort. And then he talks about living that out and how he lived uh, a holy and blameless life as well. But isn't that incredible um, just how he, how he loved and he cared? And when I see passages like this, uh, I, I always think like, why are we reading this 2,000 years from now? Wait, 2,000 years from when it was written. I didn't say that right. But, but why did God preserve this for us that we could talk about it this morning? And, and what I find interesting, I look at that and I'm like, okay, there's, there's no theological information there to give us for the church to have for all of its existence until Jesus comes back. Like, like we kind of get into some really specific theological issues uh, in, in 1 Thessalonians 4 about what happens when people die and we get into end time stuff. It'll be exciting. You guys stay tuned and keep coming for the next few weeks. And then you don't have to come anymore. That was a weird way to say that. No, just keep coming. Um, so, but why do we get this? Because relationship is so important. That that is such a mark of spiritual maturity. That this is what it looks like when God has poured his unconditional love into your heart, that it expresses itself in this way. He shows this kind of compassion and care for people that he, he only knew for three weeks, but he stayed in contact with and stayed connected to. Um, experiencing the gospel is just as important as understanding it. Isn't that true? To experience it. Is just as important. You could pick up a book. You could read just the, the, the theological truths of the gospel, which are very profound and incredible. But to experience it, well, here's a good illustration. I can tell you till you're blue in the face that God knows everything about you. He knows every deep, dark, secret thing about your life, even your thought life, right? This is God. He's all-knowing. And yet, the Bible says, that he loved us in spite of that. That even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us in our sin, not because he was impressed with us. Now, you could, you could think about that and go, okay, God has that knowledge and information. Or you could experience that by getting connected to other believers who know God's grace and love and forgiveness, know that they fall short, and that they need all of God's grace as well, and that you could come to a place of actually opening up your life to those people, sharing things that are, that are hard to share because you're worried about how people will respond to you, treat you afterwards, and yet you could experience God's grace in a beautiful way to encounter God's love in a practical way of where you connect with people that they're expressing the grace and love and forgiveness of God 
and you've come to that point of actually exposing those things to other people. That's totally different, right? And that's something, that's why we encourage you to be in community and try to, try to make it possible for you to connect with other people and then encourage you to be vulnerable and to open up and to experience the gospel at that level. Continuing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're in verse 13, and it says, And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as, as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is in, indeed at work in you who believe. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's church in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove, drove us out. They, dis, they displease God and are hostile to everyone in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved in, the, in, the, in this way. They always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. Guys, I'm going to be real honest with you. I'm getting to the point where I'm this old guy who needs readers. <laughs> and so, and every week I'm like, I ought to just turn around and read that. Um, but what is God's, or I'm sorry, what is Paul addressing here? Um, he, he's, he's encouraging them, right? Because he's saying, look, there are other believers. The, the kind of main central church, especially in the very beginning days of the church starting, was in where he described, in Judea. And, and that was this large, large uh, representation of the church. And, and this, this smaller group in Thessalonica, they're kind of almost like an outpost. But he's encouraging them saying, hey, they are suffering just like you're suffering. And so you should have this beautiful unity with what they're experiencing and knowing the difficulties that they're going through. It's not, it's not God's not, you know, punishing you or displeased with you. This is actually something that we see all of our believers uh, in Christ experiencing as well. And so that would be a great encouragement to him. What else does he mention? That we can trust and be at peace at, God, at God's justice and not try to take revenge on our own and, and, and just we're actually called to, to just rest in the fact that God will be the one who takes care of and brings justice to the situations where we are so, you know, violated. And we see the examples of this time and time in Paul's life and in this church's life. But beyond that, um, he's saying something about God's word. And so we're, we're looking into knowledge and truth and the head. And, and what he's saying is that this isn't, this isn't human wisdom, right? He mentions that. This comes from God. Paul has this incredible encounter with Jesus, and he's conveying and sharing this, this life-changing truth with them. And uh, it comes from God himself, because one of the most important things in the head, heart, hands is understanding the gospel. Understanding the gospel is vital if you're continuing to fill in the program with us, because the gospel is what? It's information that we respond to to enter into a relationship with Jesus, to become a believer, to become a Christ follower. And a huge part, if you follow Paul's kind of encouragement and, and discipleship or training up of the church, is he continually points them back to truth and to understanding the gospel. And so often they slip back into a religious mindset or they try to mix the old way of connecting with God if they have a Jewish background, the law, and the gospel. And, and he warns them time and time again. In Romans 12 too, one of the most famous passages to encourage believers in their spiritual maturity uh, gives us the instruction that we need to renew our mind, that, that our right thinking will lead to right relationships and will lead to right actions. And those are all the maturity things that we're talking about. So understanding the gospel, if you kind of get a little bit off on that, <laughs> it kind of takes you off in a, in a really unhealthy direction 
in all things. So that is so important. And you see Paul just emphasize that time and time again. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 17 through 20, let me turn and read it. But brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you, for we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we glory in the presence of Lord, the Lord Jesus when he comes? It is not you, indeed, you are our glory. Uh, is it not you? I should say that correctly. Indeed, you are our glory and joy. Again, we see beautiful, mature relationship and connection that Paul has, his true heart for these people, right? And isn't that encouraging that that's how he feels about them? But what's his desire? Hands. He's like, I want to be there with you. I, I, I want to continue to teach you and to guide you. That's the gifting and the skills that God gave Paul in many ways. He gave him many gifts and skills. But that, that's like, this is how I can like actually live out my Christian faith and help the church and build it up is by being with you. And, ah, oh, it's so frustrating that I can't. So what does he do? He literally uses his hand and writes a letter and does the same thing because he knows that all three of these things, the understanding of the gospel, the relational love and connection that he has with his people, but it doesn't end there. And then he uses his hands. Now, technically, he probably had a scribe. We, like, know that he had a scribe. Um, but he's, re- he's, he's the one, <laughs> you know, sharing this content and teaching this, this material to, uh, to this church. So here, you know, I hope you, you see as we, uh, as we see all these aspects within uh, this second chapter, we see head, heart, and hands. Because the gospel produces a desire in us to serve others. Do you see that in Paul's life? He has his theology correct, so he knows that that by serving, starting churches, doing the things that God's called them to do, he's not somehow getting God to be more pleased with him. He understands that he has the full acceptance of God through Jesus. That's how amazing and wonderful the grace is that Jesus offers and gives. He understands that. He knows that. And yet his heart is just about wanting to serve and to love these people in that way. Now I want to encourage you, like have you been in that place? You know, we're talking about spiritual maturity. And we're focusing a lot on this church and Paul and what he's doing. But what about you? You know, where are you in your spiritual growth? Have you thought about, as we've discussed this this morning, head, heart, hands? Where are you at? What is a a next practical step that God might want to encourage you in? Or lead you in. And, and, and sometimes serving can be one of the, the hardest ones to get to. Like I know, the, I, I know the gospel and I understand it. And it's so profound but amazing. And man, I have a heart for, for God's people. But serving, what, what do I do? Uh, sometimes it might be just because you've never experienced it. And I've heard so many people give this story that, you know, they, they just took a step of faith. They, they set out and they served in some way, shape, or form. I have so many friends right now today that are actually in Florida or Georgia or North or South Carolina helping. And, and a lot of those people, they, you know, they, they somehow took a step to serve and now they're addicted to it because it's so life-giving and fulfilling. And so they're on a disaster relief team, and that's why they're there now. But they love it, and they sacrifice to do it, and it fills them up. You know, when I moved here to Utah, it it surprises me. I never had Indian food. Never had Indian food before I moved here. Right? Weird. And a good friend of mine, he's a good friend now. He was one of the first uh, pastors that I met here. He said, let's go out to eat. And he took me to his his favorite Indian buffet. And I was like, "Uh uh-oh, I've never had Indian food. And so I went with him, though, because what do you do when someone says they're going to pay for your lunch? You don't don't argue. It was amazing. I was like, I've been missing out on this? This is awesome. 
My son's the exact same way. Now, you get that, right, especially, you know, if kids haven't grown up with that. He didn't because I'd never had it. And my friend had a friend whose family was from India and got invited to a big Indian festival at a local ward uh, in the neighborhood, and he went, and he didn't want to be rude, so he ate the food, which amazed me because he was kind of that chicken nugget, you know, kid, like that's all he'd eat. And he came back, I remember picking him up from the event. He's like, Dad, there's this thing called Indian food. <laughs> Don't know if you've ever experienced it. So I think that can be the case when serving. If you've never stepped into, you know, try to figure out, well, how has God wired you? What are the gifts and passions uh, that he's given you to serve? And if you've never stepped into serving, uh, I want to encourage you in your spiritual growth uh, to consider that step. Here are some next step opportunities. Um, and, and I hope instead of being posters on the wall of nice platitudes, what does this actually mean? Well, in a practical way, this can mean other things, but to try to make it as practical as possible here at SMCC, this is what it looks like. SMCCU, we focus on head maturity, understanding that type of knowledge. Um, and uh, many of you guys have taken advantage of that and taken that, those opportunities to grow in that way. Um, the heart is, is really, that's what groups are about. That, that's why we have them. It's not just because we're bored. It's not because we're lonely necessarily. I guess that could be a part of it. But we have groups because we know that we need to experience the gospel and that that will help us in our spiritual maturity, that we're wired and we're geared to connect with each other in a powerful way. When we connect with God's word and God's people, man, spiritual growth can happen in a beautiful way. And uh, serving teams. And, man, we just can't function. And that's the thing about spiritual maturity. What it allows is for the good news to be spread more, for the good news to have a greater impact on the community around it. And we see that in this example as we walk through this, this book. And so um, the bottom line is this. Jesus is restoring the image of God in you, which includes your head, your heart, and your hands. And so I want to encourage you once again, before I close, to just consider maybe what God is doing in those areas of your life. And listen to him and take that step. What, what's an area where, where God wants me to grow in my understanding, in my relational aspects, or maybe in how I serve him? God, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for this beautiful example that we see in this church in Thessalonica just the love and the passion that we see Paul have for fellow believers is so beautiful and inspiring. The truth that he clearly proclaims that just gives life to this community in Christ is so encouraging. And the way that, that, that he serves and the church serves one another. God, help us be a church like that. Help us be Jesus followers in that way. Show us and guide us in your next step that you would have us take in our spiritual maturity. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we sing this last song? One cry.
if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. And I won't be for my feelings. I hold fast to what is true. And if the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with you. Because death is just a doorway into resurrection life. And if I join you in the suffering, then I'll join you. next Sunday. You are dismissed.